Hey chi fis it's Scott Benton here, how are you? This is a USC chi fi recruitment playbook video that I wanted to put together. And I decided to put this together because a little while ago I was over at the USC chi fi house and I was talking to Jack Schroeder about recruitment. And I was telling him stories about how we used to do recruitment back in the 1980s. Now, in the mid-1980s, chi fi had about 40 members in it. And in a very short period of time, we 3 x our membership uh, in about two or three years to about 120 people. We did that very quickly. And so this video is going to cover that recruitment plan. And it's going to show you what we were doing uh, when we approached the subject of Rush. Hopefully some of these ideas will help you as well and hopefully you can incorporate them into your Rush program and your membership building as well. Now first a little bit about me. If uh, you've ever seen this video, this is the Why Kai Fi video, I'm the person that produced it. And I'm also in the video. That's me right there. Right there. And I'm also the guy who types out Why Kai Fi on the computer and I'm also hitting the, uh, the pool balls. All right, so let's get into the USC chi fi recruitment playbook. Now, in this playbook, there are going to be four subjects that we're going to study. There's the interview, there's the spark, there's the handoff, and there's the rescue. So let's get right into it. Let's start with the first bullet point, the interview. Now, what is the interview? Well, the interview is when, whenever you meet somebody, you want to do two things. You want to first just simply introduce yourself, shake their hand, tell them your name, and you want to immediately begin asking them some of the most simplest questions imaginable. This is an interview. You are uh, like a newspaper reporting. You're just simply asking them where they're from, what they're studying, why did they decide to go to USC, that sort of stuff. You might ask them what they think of Los Angeles. You might ask them about their family, if they have brothers or sisters. You might you might want to find out what side interests they have. And a question I always like to ask people is what's their favorite movie, just because I know I can talk about movies for a long time. And I know that um, there are a lot of movie fans, not everybody, but there are a lot of them. So uh, that's always a good subject for me. Now, basically, when you first meet someone, Someone, you want to turn yourself into essentially a talk show host. You, The person that you're meeting and the person that you're talking to is your guest on the talk show host and you are directing all of the questions at them. Now, if you want a good example or two of interviews that I think are really strong, I'm, I, tend to, I tend to listen to a lot of podcasts and two of the podcasts that I find are excellent when it comes to just sort of listening in on what a good interview sounds like. Uh, one of them is the WTF podcast with Mark Marin, and the other is the Tim Ferriss podcast. I think both of those are excellent sources for you to sort of hone and sharpen your own interviewing skills. Now, there are some rules that you might like to follow when it comes to interviewing people. And just Remember that the interview questions are made up of the easiest and most general questions imaginable. You, you already know all of them. Um, they're readily available to you. You always want to have a number of general questions that you can ask anybody. I, I usually have just a handful, four or five, to really just get a conversation going. But you might want to just at some point think about maybe between five and ten general questions. You can just take them even off that list that you just saw about where someone's from, what they're studying at USC, why they chose USC, ask about their family maybe, um, and their background and their interests, all that kind of stuff. You just want to have a handful of general questions. And these are questions that you're going to ask everybody when you first meet them. You're just going to pull those questions out over and over and over again. And keep in mind that there are literally hundreds of general questions that you can always add to your list if you, for some reason, get tired of asking the standard questions. But for me, for years, I've just been asking the same questions over and over and over again. And at this point, it's just totally unconscious. Uh, I do it whenever I meet somebody, and it works pretty well. I think you'll find that you'll have the same, um, the same experience. Uh, yourself. Now, the goal in the interview is to always keep the conversation moving. But if for some reason the conversation begins to flag or just fizzles out or something, just know that you can always go back to your list of general questions and start asking those again to, uh, to pick up the conversation once more. Okay, 
So that's the interview. Let's move on to the second bullet point, and that's called the spark. Now, why, let's ask ourselves, are we interviewing people the minute that we meet them? Why are we firing all these super easy questions at them uh, just to get a conversation going? Well, the reason is you're trying to discover the spark, okay? That's it. You're going to go from interview to spark. Now, what is the spark? Well, the spark is that one thing that makes a person tick and everybody has a spark. Everybody has something that they're interested in or passionate about or uh, that they think about all the time or that they've studied. And people in general, they absolutely love to talk about their spark and they will talk about it forever. And that's what you're trying to get to. So when you're interviewing somebody, you want to listen closely so that you can find that spark as quickly as possible. And you'll be surprised that people will generally tell you what their spark is within the first between, I find, three to five minutes of conversation. So you really only need to have a few of these interview questions that you can use to just really get that kind of conversation going and you want to listen for, uh, listen to their answers and how they're responding to you because um, in general, people will just unconsciously start to talk about the things that they're most interested in. And when you have discovered that spark based on the answers that you're getting, you want to seize on that moment. You want to seize on that spark. And once you discover what that spark is, you want to stop the interview questions and you want to zero in on that one subject and talk about that one subject for as long as possible. Now, once you do have the spark, you have three options. You have three places to go from there. The first option is that their spark just happens to turn out to be one of your sparks. Now, this is the best possible situation you can be in because if their spark is also your spark, if, if what they're passionate about is that you're equally as passionate about that subject, then there's really no more work to do. You're going to have a two-hour conversation. You're going to become lifelong friends, and that person's going to join your house. They, they just simply are. It's going to probably be one of the best conversations you ever have. The second option is that their spark is the same spark as somebody else, and we're going to come back to this bullet point. The third spark is that their spark is, or the, I'm sorry, the third option is that their spark is unique and it's something that you're going to have to focus on and learn out all about. In other words, it's not your spark and it's not someone else's spark. Their spark is just, is individual to the person that you're talking to and you're going to recognize that and just learn all about that subject. Now, back in 1936, this, uh, there was a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie that was published. And um, this is a book that a lot of people kind of start with when they begin to read business books or communications books. People that are in sales will often read this book because it helps them connect with people very, very quickly. A lot of the advice and examples in the book um, really kind of boil down to common sense, but frankly, I don't think you can get enough exposure to common sense. This is a book that influences people throughout their lives, and it's very much worth reading. Now, you notice that 1936 is really only two years after Kai-Fi was first established at the University of Southern California. The book uh, the picture on the uh, uh, lower left-hand corner is the house on West Adams Street that the Eta Delta chapter of the USC Chi-Fi fraternity first lived in when they were established. Now, in this book, there are a couple of passages in Chapter 5 that I'm, I'm just going to read to you because they speak to the idea that somebody's spark is unique to them and how to handle that situation. And this is an important, um, this is an important piece of knowledge for you to have because more often than not, people are just going to have sparks, things that interest them that really no one has really thought much about or hasn't really become interested in themselves. But if somebody is interested in a subject, you want to be able to address that. And here, here are the passages. Chapter 5, How to Interest People. Everyone who was ever a guest of Theodore Roosevelt was astonished at the range and diversity of his knowledge. Whether his visitor was a cowboy or a rough rider, a New York politician or a diplomat, Roosevelt knew what to say. And how was that done? The answer was simple. Whenever Roosevelt expected a visitor, he sat up late the night before reading up on the subject in which he knew his guest was particularly interested. For Roosevelt knew, as all leaders know, that the royal road to a person's heart is to talk about the thing he or she treasures most. Okay, and then the chapter goes on to one more important passage. I'll read that to you. 
The genial William Lyon Phelps, essayist and professor of literature at Yale, learned this lesson uh, early in life. When I was eight years old and was spending a weekend visiting my Auntie Libby Lindsay in her home in Stratford on the Housatonic, he wrote in an essay on human nature, a middle-aged man called one evening, and after a polite skirmish with my aunt, he devoted his attention to me. At that time, I happened to be excited about boats, and the visitor discussed the subject in a way that seemed to me particularly interesting. After he left, I spoke of him with enthusiasm. What a man! My aunt informed me he was a New York lawyer, that he cared nothing whatever about boats, that he took not the slightest interest in the subject. But why then did he talk all the time about boats? Because he is a gentleman. He saw you were interested in boats and he talked about the things he knew would interest and please you. He made himself agreeable. And William Lyon Phelps added, I never forgot my aunt's remark. Now, what was the characteristic of this New York lawyer that made such an impression on William Lyon Phelps when he was only eight years old, so much so that decades later, he not only remembered the story, but told the story to Dale Carnegie as a pivotal moment in his entire life when it came to uh, just general communication skills. What was the quality that the New York attorney had? Well, that quality was he made himself agreeable. And when you're talking to people during rush or you're talking to people in whatever social environment you're in, you want to remember to make yourself agreeable. You will make a favorable impression, a very good favorable impression on whoever it is that you're talking to if you talk about the things that they find the most interesting that please them. Now, there are a few side notes that you'll want to know. We know that you want to talk about the person that you're talking to, and we want to talk about their interests or their spark. Now, it's important that you don't talk about yourself. Don't talk about yourself. However, there is one caveat to this rule, and that is don't talk about yourself unless they ask you to. If they start reverse uh, interviewing you, then of course you want to have that conversation. You, you want to talk about yourself at that point. But keep in mind that you still want to find a moment to return the spotlight back on them. You want to look for that opportunity because you don't. it's very easy just to get sucked into talking about yourself all the time. And you want to be mindful that the spotlight belongs on them, especially during rush events. Now, there is one other rule that you must always follow. And this rule is going to take a few minutes to explain. But let's unpack this rule because I think it's going to be um, a very powerful um, uh, a, po a very powerful path for you to follow when it comes to just basic conversations. Now, if you've ever seen uh, an improv troupe or maybe you've watched the television show Whose Line Is It Anyway, which is all based on improv, there is what's called the golden rule of improv, and this is the rule that uh, anybody who does improv has used uh, from the very beginning. This is the rule that has been responsible for successful season after successful season of whose line is it anyway. And this is the rule that you must start to use as well. And what is that rule? The rule is called, this is the golden rule of improv, the rule is called yes and. Now what does yes and mean? Well, in improv, the first person will make a statement and the second person will take whatever the first person says and they will add to it or they'll move it forward or plus it. Then the first person will take what the second person says and they will plus that or move it forward. And this game will go on over and over and over and over again. And sketches can simply go on indefinitely with this one simple rule. Now this is the rule that you must learn and master. Now, you're going to realize, once you know the yes and rule, that out in the world, if you begin to eavesdrop on conversations, you're going to start to hear people speaking with a different rule. And their rule is yes, but. Not yes and, but yes, but. Now, if you don't know the yes and rule, you will always default back to the yes, but rule. Now, what's yes, but? Yes, but is... 
uh, remember what in yes and the first person makes a statement and the second person pluses it or adds it or moves it forward. In yes but, it's exactly the opposite. The first person will make a statement and the second person will either uh, undercut them or cut them down, contradict them, or they will uh, place themselves at an acute angle. In other words, they will stop the flow of conversation. And when you begin to listen to the outside world, it's going to sound to you like everyone is talking in this yes, but conversational style. The problem with the yes, but conversational style is that it leaves people feeling not very good about the conversation, maybe frustrated. They could even end up hurting their feelings. Um, But the question is, why is it, if you have a choice between yes, but, and yes, and, why is it that people so often and so frequently use the yes, but conversation style? Well, if you go turn on your television right now and you turn it on to any single program out there, this works for movies as well, by the way, the, um, the general... Uh, the general sort of construct of drama or comedy, which is essentially the same thing, is grounded in conflict. Characters must never, ever, 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 ever agree with one, one, one another. They always must be in a state of disagreement and conflict. In essence, in drama, they are always using yes, but. Now, it's not always obvious that they're in disagreement with each other. I mean, you can tell if people are beating up each other or trying to shoot each other with a gun or if they're in some kind of screaming argument. But even if they're friends together having a conversation, just notice that they are also in disagreement with one another. Now, after tens of thousands of hours of watching television and this kind of programming, it's very easy to begin to adopt this type of conversation strategy. But ultimately, this, uh, this type of conversation strategy, while it works on television and movies, and in television, um, Yes But will give you big ratings because an audience will watch Yes But. Um, dramas and comedies, um, it is not good for conversations that you have out socially with people that you meet in the real world. So if you don't already know that you're using yes, but pay attention to your conversation style and notice how often you fall back into this pattern. And now that you know the yes and rule, you want to do everything you can to scrub the yes, but programming out of your uh, conversational software. You want to replace yes, but with yes, and yes, and is going to always move the conversation forward and it's going to keep the conversation positive and going. And you're going to find that by using yes and, this becomes the pathway to the infinite conversation. You're going to have conversations that you're not going to want to end. They're going to be some of the best conversations that you've ever had. And although you these conversations will go on forever, it will seem like you will never have enough time to finish what it is you're talking about. Now, if you really want to master the yes and rule um, or the yes and conversational strategy, one of the things you can do is take an improv workshop. I know that there's an improv workshop at USC. Uh, Jack Schroeder went and took an improv workshop. You can ask him about it. He ended up getting a lot out of the work he did in improv. Now, you would take it, uh, but also, by the way, there are plenty of improv workshops out there you can go to, whether it's through a university or just out in the community. You can find those. They're in every city, and they're going to be extremely valuable to you. Now, you would take an improv class not because you'd want to be a, a stand-up comedian or join a, an improv troupe or or whatever. Although maybe those are, if you are going to do any of those things, then uh, then you definitely want to get yourself into an improv workshop. Um, but you're going to learn a lot. Uh, of skills that you can use out in business, out in, let's say, for job interviews, out in the world, and socially just by mastering the, this yes and rule. Another place that you can go real quickly is you can look for Toastmasters International. Now, Toastmasters has been around since the 1920s. And these or, this organization, you'll find Toastmasters groups worldwide. Uh, just go onto their website, find a Toastmasters group near you. You can go to them for free. When you finally join, it'll probably be uh, for maybe 30 or 40 bucks. And uh, if that, and what Toastmasters is, is it's a group that studies um, public speaking. You're going to develop 
primarily two skills. You're going to develop extemporaneous speaking, which is off-the-cuff speaking, and you're going to develop an ability with prepared speeches. So this, uh, these are both great um, uh, areas to go into, either find an improv class or join Toastmasters or both, and uh, you're going to find that your ability with conversation is going to, is going to dramatically increase. Okay, I wanted to put, play a video clip that I, I think really illustrates this yes and rule very, very well. Now, they, instead of yes but, they use the term no actually, but yes but and no actually are exactly the same things. And I think this serves as a very good example of, of using this yes and rule. Here we go. Yeah, arguing sucks. It's a total buzzkill. It kills the creativity and you really just don't get anywhere. There is, however, a simple way that we can prevent arguments and conversations and influence them towards greater understanding and creativity. This is called being a yes and rather than a no actually, and I'll tell you what that means. This was inspired by classic stage improv. And in improv, when you're up on the stage with somebody and you're, you're in dialogue, if the other person says, hey, I have an apple, and you say, no, actually, that's an orange, uh, it kind of kills the creative flow. If the person says, hey, I have an apple, and you say, yes, and it's so juicy, I can't wait to take a bite of it, you're saying yes and acknowledging what the other person said and adding to it with whatever you have to say afterwards. I think we should have a custom party. <gasps> No, actually I don't like that idea. I think we should do a pool party, that's much better. No, actually a pool party is boring. No, costume party is just taking it way over the top. No, actually you're taking it way over the top. Ugh, God. Wah, wah. The word no triggers our fight or flight response and raises our stress hormones like cortisol. So it actually doesn't feel good to be in those kind of no actually defensive conversations. I think we should have a party. Yeah, I love that idea. And it could be a themed party. Yes, and that theme could be a costume party. Yeah, and there's lots of other possibilities too, like a pool party. Yes, and I think a costume party is more creative. Yes, and what would be more creative is if we combined them. We could do a pool party that's a costume party. Yes, and people would actually be able to wear their underwater costumes. Right, yes. Swimming and costumes. That's awesome. It is like the Little Mermaid. It's a Little Mermaid party. <laughs> I knew you were going to manifest a Little Mermaid party. Yes! High five. <laughs> <laughs> With the yes, the person feels understood and is open for the and. And in that and, you have the ability to influence the conversation in a way that the other person can actually hear it. So being a yes and or a no actually is less about the words and more about how you're showing up in your energy. Are you open or are you closed? Are you accepting or are you judging? Are you a starter or are you a stopper? Now this doesn't mean that you need to go around agreeing to everything or saying yes when you really don't want to. Obviously, if somebody is overstepping your boundaries or is being inappropriate, definitely just say no. No. So this is just a little tip on how we can be more flowing and creative in our conversations and our relationships. Okay, and that takes us to the third bullet point, the handoff. So for the handoff, we want to go back to this slide. There are three spark options once the spark has been discovered. And we're gonna focus in on this middle bullet point. The spark is the same spark as someone else. So let's say you're talking to somebody and it's a, at a rush event and you are simply using your very, very easy, simple interview style questions. Where are you from? Why did you pick USC? What are you studying? What year are you? Um, and through that conversation, you very quickly discover what their spark is. Now, you begin to talk about the spark because you're going to focus on that one subject, but you realize in the conversation that their spark is the same spark as someone else. When that happens, it's time for you to think about conducting the handoff. Now, what is the handoff? Well, the handoff is the one critical move that you are going to need to master, so it's going to take a little bit of practice. You want to talk about the brother 
to the person that you're speaking to who has the same interest and you want to mention any details about the brother that you know, so like maybe where they're from or what they're studying, what year they are in school, just that kind of thing. And then you want to say, I'd like to introduce you to this person. You want to make the introduction to that brother. And when you make the introduction, it's important that you say what the spark is. This person's interested in um, billiards and, uh, and so are you. So you want to make sure that that subject is introduced uh, along with the introduction, I guess that's redundant, but you want to introduce the subject with the introduction. And then you want to stir up the conversation. You want to get the conversation going. Um, once the conversation has kind of been taken over by the, the other two people, you want, then you want to step back. You want to excuse yourself so you can go meet other guests. And the thing about the handoff is, in general, you want to practice this maneuver. It usually takes three people until you have this perfected so that when you are actually doing the handoff, um, it's done so pretty effortlessly and you'll see how easy this is once you, once you practice it. Um, now, at the same time, if somebody hands off to you, it's important that you recognize that you have the same spark as the person you're about to meet. And the person, again, making the introduction is going to tell you what that spark is. That means you get to bypass all of those um, interview questions. So they are going to get the conversation going, and so are you. You're also going to get the conversation going because you know what the plan is. The plan is to talk about the spark. The plan is to talk about that one subject for as long as possible. Now, fortunately, if the conversation ever slows or ends or starts to just fizzle out, since you haven't had the interview question, questions that you've had to use, you can always go back to them to try and find another spark and start the process over. However, when you are talking to these people that you're meeting, um, make sure that in the conversation at some point you get their contact inf information. Now, this is going to be critical because this is what it's all leading up to. It's leading up to the next day follow-up. So if you spoke to anybody for any length of time at all, it is your responsibility to call them directly the next day. And you're calling them because you want to invite them back to the house. In that conversation, you want to mention uh, something about the conversation that you had uh, previously and you want to say that you enjoy talking to them. But let them know there are others in the house that you would like them to meet. And after you hang up with them, you want to prepare the other brothers for the person that you spoke to and let them know that, you, that they will hopefully be coming by so that you can introduce them. Everyone will already know what that spark is so that they are prepared to talk about that one subject only. Now, this is the critical, critical component in your rush plan because everything that you've done, the interview, the finding of the spark, discussion of the spark or the handoff leads up to uh, the follow-up call. And if you don't follow up with people the next day, then that is essentially an automatic fumble. You've dropped the ball because this is what it's all leading to. If you do contact them the next day, whether they come back to the house or not, that's an automatic touchdown. That's an automatic win because you have left a favorable imp impression of yourself, of the house, of the people in the house, if you contact them and invite them back. They may not come back right away, but I'll bet you anything they're going to come back eventually. Okay, that brings us to the last bullet. Now, this is the rescue. The rescue is something, it's just, it's worth mentioning and knowing about. Hopefully, you won't have to use this very often, but you just want to have this, um, uh, the rescue plan in your toolkit in case you ever need to use it. So, what is the rescue? Well, occasionally, you're going to find yourself in a conversation that you just, for some reason, you can't get out of. You want to, once you realize you're not able to get out of this conversation so easily, you want to make sure that you always remain polite and courteous no matter what. And this is important because at the end of the day, you don't want to insult or criticize anybody that you're talking to. You want them to, you want them to leave having a, a favorable impression of you and the house and the organization because they will talk about their experience with the house on the outside. You want to instead uh, find a respectful way to exit the conversation. And if you're not able to find a respectful way to exit the conversation, then it's simply time to send up the rescue flares. And once you've sent up the res rescue flares, you want to just wait for somebody to orchestrate the rescue. Now, what is the rescue flare? What does that mean? Because you're not going to actually send up a rescue flare. 
The rescue signal or rescue flare is going to be a simple piece of body language that uh, you're all going to pick and agree on. It could be something as simple as crossing your arms in front of your chest or maybe holding your wrist behind your back or whatever small, subtle signal you're going to use that is going to signal the, that, uh, that a rescue maneuver needs to be attempted here. Um, and once that signal is sent up, if you see somebody send up that signal, you want to then immediately go over to that person and introduce the person they're talking to. You want to begin asking those, those simple interview style questions and you really just want to take over the conversation until the person who sent out the rescue signal can just excuse himself. And when you do excuse yourself from a conversation, always make sure to shake the person's hand, tell them it was nice to meet them before leaving. And once you're uh, once you've taken over the conversation, you want to simply repeat the process. You want to find their spark and uh, and if you need to conduct a handoff, you want to conduct that handoff. If you get stuck, you can simply send out the rescue signal as well. Now, unless a person is being incredibly disruptive or belligerent, just simply allow them to maintain, to remain at your event and enjoy themselves. This is a, this is a situation you can manage pretty easily just by, if you have to, in the worst case scenario, scenario, you'll do just rescue maneuver after rescue maneuver after rescue maneuver, which is fine, but you never want to let one brother get stuck in a conversation for hours. It's just, it can be kind of a waste of your resources. Um, remember that Rush is designed with a natural filtering process for individuals who are not quite yet ready to join your group. And you just need to let that sort of natural filtering process play itself out. Keep in mind that Rush can be a, a very nerve-wracking experience for some people. It can be sort of like a job interview. It's an unnatural and an unfamiliar environment unless you have a lot of practice in it. And so people can be very nervous and say really strange things and dis display very strange behaviors. Um, I always found that it was very difficult to get to really know people during Rush. And I there were plenty of occasions myself where I had a very unfavorable impression of somebody that came through Rush. But then they made it into um, Kai-Fi. And uh, you know, it wasn't until they initiated that I really got to know them and really got to like them. And I was happy that my first impressions of them during Rush were inaccurate. So consider, just consider the, the nature of the environment that they're in and that this is a very unnatural and unfamiliar environment for a lot of people. If you've been through Rush many times, then it's going to be, you know, um, it's going to be old territory for you. But for a lot of people, it's, it's very, very new. Uh, with that in mind, you want to work to make your rush event as stress-free and comfortable as possible for the people uh, who have never met you. And uh, you, want to, you want to focus in on mitigating that kind of nerve-wracking environment that, that it potentially can become. And one of the ways you do that, of course, is to go back to this rule and always make yourself agreeable. So those are the four bullet points. That's the interview. That's the spark. Uh, the handoff, and the rescue. But before I finish this presentation, I want to give you the formula that we used back in the 80s to go from 40 people to 120 people. Um, that, that process probably took two or three years, and it's, it's a very simple formula, and this is what we just did over and over and over and over again. And we grew our pledge classes very rapidly and soon our organization had just you know had had really topped out at 120. Um, before I go into that I want to I want to just sort of highlight a, a few books now I've read a lot of books on fraternity life and uh, I've looked at a lot of resources on on rush and these are six books that I think uh, are excellent in fact I've bought a copy of these books for the house the house has all of them and if you get a chance to read either one or a couple or all of these books you're gonna find that your mind has just an absolute is an absolute cauldron of information that you can draw from when it comes to creative ideas for your recruitment program and for rush um, these books are all fairly short. They might take an hour or two to get through, and you can even read all of them uh, quickly. I, I've read these more than once, and one or two of them I've read maybe three times. Uh, I, I find they're a valuable, valuable source of information. You can also go to, if you don't already know, the Kai-Fi website, and uh, you can find recruitment resources in a little tab at the top, the top right there, 
called Kai-Fi Connect. If you haven't registered for Kai-Fi Connect, you're going to want to do that. And inside Kai-Fi Connect, you can find some very valuable uh, recruitment resources as well. Kai-Fi National also has every semester a live webinar that you can sign up for. And I highly recommend that you watch their webinar on recruitment. There's an enormous amount of value there as well. Now, here's the problem with all of these sources when it comes to recruitment. Um, All of them seem to want you to become either a high-pressure salesman, they want you to pitch and sell Kai-Fi, or they want you to become a strategic mastermind. Now, I have found that placing an expectation like that on somebody does nothing but simply shut them down. And um, becoming a salesperson or a strategic mastermind is something that people spend years and years and years learning. And I've also noticed that becoming a salesperson and a strategic mastermind is that people can go through their entire careers without ever learning either of these subjects. So if you're going to become somebody that's very knowledgeable about sales and very knowledgeable about strategy, and I highly recommend you do that, Uh, This is something that you're going to have to study on your own. It's probably going to take workshops and books or just life experience in general in order to become very efficient and very good at that. Now, a lot of people, or I should say some people occasionally, people are born with a natural ability to sell and a natural ability to master strategy. But those are very, very few people who uh, just kind of show up with those skills. Now, if you have those skills, if you were born, if you're a born salesperson or a born strategist, by all means, use your ability to sell and your your strategic ability to, uh, to market and sell Kai-Fi. But for the vast majority of the rest of us, this is, these are skills that we're going to have to learn. And like I said, putting an expectation on people to be good at sales and good at strategy, um, it simply shuts them down. And inevitably, what happens is the person who signed up to be the rush chair finds himself in a rudderless boat paddling frantically and getting nowhere. So somehow we need to change this around. We need to find a way to make sure that everybody is pulling on the oars at the same time and going in the same direction. In this version, um, uh, in this in this idea anyway, uh, the, the rush chairman, instead of doing all the work, the rush chairman is simply keeping everybody on track and keeping everybody pulling on those oars at the same time. That's the way that you're going to grow your organization as quickly as possible. Now, there's also something called 24-7 recruitment or 24-7-365. And this is something that it... it Sometimes it just doesn't make sense. What is 24-7 recruitment? Well, you know, we know that there's a, there's a rush week at the beginning of each semester, and um, most houses just kind of focus on rush during that one week. Rush concludes. You've given out your bids. You have a certain amount of new members. Those members will go through the new member process. They'll finally initiate, and now you have your new members. So why would you spend the rest of the time uh, recruiting? Uh, Recruitment, it takes so much work anyway. Why would you spend the rest of your school semester engaged in recruitment activities? Well, we just need to define this a little bit better. Um, There is a way to do 24-7 recruitment, and it's easier than you think. But in order to do it successfully, you have to have the ideal conditions. So let's explore what those ideal conditions are. The ideal conditions are that there needs to be no extra homework to do. So I've now shown you seven books, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and then those six books on on fraternity life and recruitment. But you need to not read any of those books, or it shouldn't, at least it shouldn't be a requirement. If you read the books, great, you're going to get a lot out of them. But But in the ideal conditions, there should be no homework to do, no extra homework. There shouldn't be a requirement for you to learn high pressure sales tactics. We're going to throw that out the window. We're going to take it straight off the table. You don't need to become a strategic mastermind. We're taking that off the table. It needs to be something that anyone can do immediately, or I should say that everyone can do immediately. It needs to be something that everyone can do as a team, like pulling on the oars together and and, uh, pulling on the oars in time so that you're going efficiently to the destination you're trying to reach. 
There needs to be no specialized skills or abilities that you need to develop. It can't be cheesy, it can't be lame, and it can't make you feel uncomfortable. It's got to be effortless, it has to be painless, and above all, it needs to make you look good. So we need to distill our rush strategy, our long game, our uh, you know, 24-7, 365 uh, rush strategy, we need to distill that down to one simple idea. And it's got to be something that you can memorize. So it's going to be a line of dialogue. And it's going to be this one single line of dialogue that is going to be responsible for you building your organization up efficiently and quickly with, with high quality members, uh, the way that we were able to build up our uh, organization back in the um, uh, uh, mid to mid to late uh, 1980s. Now, in the way that it's uh, you memorize like the Gather Brothers song or the Kaifi Creed, it's got to be something that you can memorize. But we don't want you to take any time memorizing it. So here's it. Here here it is. Here is the uh, entire um, line of dialogue that you must memorize. Why don't you stop by the house Thursday night? That's it. That's the whole formula. That's what we used in the 1980s. That's how we went from 40 members to 120 members in two or three years. And this is what you're going to use as well. So what, what does that mean? Well, that means that every time you meet somebody in class or in one of your on-campus organizations or a sports team or even, even just if you're out socially talking to people, you want to remember to always invite them to the house on Thursday night. Now, why Thursday night? Well, Thursday night is uh, the night at USC where all of the houses have their social events. Their social events, predictably, always take place on Thursday night. And, and so will yours, by the way, at the house. So you want to make sure that every Thursday night you have a nice social event. You want to put your energy, energy into making that social event successful. And when the people show up, you want to meet them, you want to interview them, you want to find their spark, and you want to conduct the handoff if necessary. Now, it's also important, if this is how you're going to do 24-7 rush, that every Thursday night that the house looks immaculate. It has to look good. It has to be clean from top to bottom. It has to be organized. When people show up, they've got to be impressed. When they uh, arrive at your house outside. The house has to have curb appeal. It has to look nice. When they go inside, everything needs to be cleaned and scrubbed and and um, and cared about. So the way that you're going to accomplish this is that every Thursday afternoon, this is what we did, every Thursday afternoon, you're going to have a Thursday afternoon work party and you're going to clean the house from top to bottom because the goal is to make it look impressive. So you're going to make it look as presentable uh, as possible and as organized as possible. That means that the floors are going to need to be vacuumed and mopped. All the garbage and debris, it has to be thrown out. All the furniture is, needs to be wiped down, straightened, and organized. And most importantly, the house must never, ever, ever, ever smell bad. There are many ways that you can get a bad smell out of a house and you need to look those up. And some of those are like baking cookies, cookies that you can use for your Thursday night events if you like. But the worst thing that you can do is have a bad smelling house. People who are real estate agents or brokers know this. And uh, if somebody who's looking to buy a house shows up at a house in a house and it's, and it's beautiful, but the house smells, they're not buying that house. So if people show up, at your fraternity house and it smells, even if it's nice, even if it's been vacuumed and mopped and organized and it looks good and cared for, if it smells bad, they're not joining your house. So you need to go online and figure out all the ways that are very economical, very cheap, but not, not expensive at all, or in many cases uh, don't cost anything. You need to figure out how to make sure the house never smells bad. The house must always, always, always look uh, comfortable and inviting. Now, there's one other thing that you need to remember for Thursday night, and it's important. You must always stay in character. When people show up at the house, you need to be in character, and you need to be in character all Thursday night. What does that mean? Well, if you've ever been to Disneyland and you take a look around, you're going to start to notice there are a number of signs that say cast members only. 
Why cast members? Cast members? How, how come it doesn't say employees only? It says cast members only because people that work at Disneyland, this isn't just a job to them. This is a daily performance. They are part of a performing troupe. They are part of the cast. And uh, when they are working in the park, they are performing. Therefore, they are in character. So you'll notice that on every ride and attraction, um, the people that are working there, they never, ever, ever break character. Never. Look at the picture on the upper right-hand corner. Those, all those people work in the Haunted Mansion, and you can see they sort of, they're in character because they have their funeral face on. It's very dour and down and serious. Um, down in the lower right-hand corner is Snow White, and she's going to always be caring and attentive and kind and nice. None of these people are ever going to break character. They're never going to jump outside of the character that they are embodying. Uh, if they do, they're not going to be working at the park for very long. So similarly, uh, on Thursday night, uh, when people start to show up that you've invited to the house because you have told a number of people throughout the week in your classes or other on-campus organizations, hey, why don't you stop by the house on Thursday night? And they begin to show up. And if they show up, and people are on their phones and just kind of relaxing, listening to music, or they're bored, or they're hanging out, and they're just sort of disengaged, then that's a form of not being in character. And if you're not in character, then uh, you are leaving an enormous amount of money on the table. Because what happens is people aren't going to feel good. And people aren't going to have a good impression of you or the, uh, or the house that you're in or the organization. They're probably not going to want to come back because they, they didn't enjoy themselves. But they will enjoy themselves if you're in character. And if you're engaging with them and you, you introduce yourself and you interview them and you talk to them for a little while and you find their spark and then you talk about that subject, the subject that they're interested in, you better believe that they're not only going to come back, but they're going to join your house. And the whole key to the plan, the whole key to our plan was that we were doing this all throughout the semester so that by the time Rush came up, we, I mean, we barely had to advertise our house at all. We just, we already were friends with a, a number of people that we knew were very interested in coming over to our house every week to kind of hang out. We've, a lot of us became friends with people. Um, that's how I got recruited. I ended up meeting, ended up meeting a, a lot of guys um, um, from the Kai-Fi house. And when Rush came up, uh, there was, there was no other house I was even considering. And that's what's going to happen for you. Um, Rush becomes, I, I'm not going to say it's effortless because you still have, you still have to be in character, you still have to be on, and you still have to plan your events. But a lot of people are going to show up to those events, and there's already going to be an expectation that people are going to want to join. This is what they mean by 24-7 recruitment. And you can accomplish 24-7 recruitment, again, simply by saying, why don't you stop by the house on Thursday night? Okay, now what? Well, we want to try out these ideas, try them out for yourself, see what works. You want to practice interviews with each other. So you might pair up and just take turns interviewing each other with, remember, the simplest, simplest questions imaginable. Where are you from? What do you think of USC? Do you like Los Angeles? That type of stuff. You want to practice finding the spark and then switching from the interview questions into questions about the thing the person is interested in and just talk about that subject for, forever. You're going to notice that you're not going to have to do a lot of talking, that you're just going to ask the questions and the person, because they're so passionate about whatever subject it is, that they're just going to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk ad infinitum. You want to practice conducting the handoff. Like I said, this generally takes three people to, um, to orchestrate. And then you want to practice the rescue. Remember that you want to use what works. You want to abandon or modify everything else. You want to refine the tools in your toolkit until they work well for your specific environment. Just because I'm saying it on this presentation doesn't automatically mean it's going to work, but you do want to try some of these ideas out. And remember that you want to just you want to adjust them so that they work as well as they can. You want to find a way to work together as a team, like a cleanly oiled machine. You want to pull on those oars together. And uh, you don't want to just leave 
uh, all of the work up to the rush chairman or one or two people. That's an, an enormous amount of work that's going to burn them out and it's going to frustrate them and it's going to, they're going to just become disillusioned. But, you, but if you all um, do this together very easily, then you're, you, you won't believe uh, the results that you're going to get. And you want to ma make sure that you're going to maximize your numbers. If at the end of rush you have a pretty good, healthy, strong um, new member class, then uh, you know you're headed in the right direction. Okay, so then what? Well, keep updating your Rush program as necessary. Don't use ideas that don't work. Use ideas that don't work. And finally, when you have a good handle on all of this, why don't you just make your own video and share it with others out there and help them reach their recruitment goals. Let them know what's helping and working for you uh, in order to build and maintain a community to help each other continually grow and succeed. So that's it. Those are the four bullets. There's the, there's the interview, there's the spark, there's the handoff, and there's the rescue. And that is the USC Ki-Fi Recruitment Playbook. I hope this has been helpful. Um, if you have any questions, you can always certainly get in touch with me. I hope that these ideas are helpful for you. Let me know what's working and what's not working. And uh, take care. I hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye.